Uh, not only is there little information about uh, Wiggler films uh, outside of, of the Wiggler region, but inside the Wiggler region too, uh, little is known about the history. So why don't we start from, uh, from the very beginning? Um, because this could actually be the very first discussion anyone has ever had about Wiggler films and uh, the filmmaking industry in, in the Wiggler communities. This is Uyghur Stories, stories from the Uyghur diaspora. Hello, John. Hi, Mukadas. How are you today? I'm very good. I am very happy to be back here with you in the podcast world and to be making another episode of Uyghur Stories. Yeah, this is a very special one because um, I have been working on my film for uh several months now so i i know you have i understand the struggle for making a fiction film it's like um running a big business or a factory you know like you have to bring a lot of people <laughs> together and do this 30 minutes of film to tell a story mm-hmm. so yeah and um that made me thinking of like how difficult it is to to make films and how important it is as well to um, films talk about, share, or show the stories of a particular region or a particular group of people. Um, so today's episode is actually about film in Uyghur region, films about Uyghur people or films that Uyghur people made. So that's something that I'm excited to share with you about. Yeah, I'm really excited too, because this isn't something that I know very much about at all. And, um, you know, as we were getting ready for this episode, I was looking around and there aren't a lot of um, resources, you know, that are available, at least not to a English speaker like me, where I could find out more about the history of film in the Uyghur region or about Uyghur filmmakers. So, uh, I think this is a really uh, important and sort of, in a lot of ways, unique conversation about some of the history and some of the story that folks won't be able to find anywhere else. So I went to Tahir Hamut that we all know and uh, respect, and he uh, is a filmmaker and he has been teaching film at the Uh, art institute in Urumqi when he was still there so I think he was the uh, one of the best people to talk about to understand and learn about Uyghur film history and what has happened to Uyghur filmmakers that's great yeah I'm really excited to listen to this conversation with Tahir and I'll just add for our listeners that Mukadas recorded this conversation with Tahir in Uyghur and so we will be uh, playing a translation of that interview in English that Mukadas recorded with an actor. Man Tahir Hamut Izgil, Shair Hamri Jisor. Man Kashkada Tolgan. My name is uh, Tahir Hamut Izgil, and I was born in Kashgar, and I've been working as a filmmaker and director ever since 1998. I've directed TV shows, documentaries, movies, uh, theater productions, and, and many other genres. Uh, I've actually been working in the industry for 20 years uh, until 2017 when I moved to the U.S. Yeah, I know your work. Um, I'm not a big expert, but I know your work. Uh, you're um, an important figure in Uyghur film industry. There's really little information about um, Uyghur film or films about Uyghurs. So uh, could you please explain, um, is there any film industry existed in Uyghur region? Is it something important? Could you please give us a background story of Uyghur film world? Uh, Not only is there little information about uh, Wiggler films uh, outside of of the Wiggler region, but inside the Wiggler region too, uh, little is known about the history. So why don't we start from uh, from the very beginning? Um, Because this could actually be the very first discussion anyone has ever had about Wiggler films and uh, the filmmaking industry in in the Wiggler communities. Mm-hmm. Um, motion pictures were first introduced uh, in Wiggle communities in the early 20th century, probably around the mid 1910s. Uh, around 1914 or 1915, the Musselby brothers had purchased equipment for a leather making factory in Germany and brought it back to Holja to start a business. 
At that time, the brothers were in discussion with the original owners of the equipment about how to construct and run a factory. To help them better understand the inner workings, the original owners gave them a movie projector and a series of films demonstrating the operations of the factory and the machines. This film was then shown to factory workers. So it's really kind of a, a surprising start to films. But back then, the educational guide on how to put together machinery and construct a, a factory had become a cessation in the city. It attracted crowds to visit and watch uh, almost as a form of entertainment. As you can imagine, news and information traveled slowly at that time to the geographic location of Ulja and for other reasons. But this would mark the first time that the Wiggler people had ever been introduced to films. It's fascinating. It's um, As you mentioned, at that time, there was so limited com communication in between the um, Wigger region and the rest of the world. But a film um, to how to build a factory came and then it, it connected people uh, through motion pictures. It's really interesting. It kind of reminded me uh, the Lumiere brothers, um, their very first film and um, that is really famous uh, in the world as a founder of fathers of uh, uh, film industry. It was about factory. It was about people who's um, getting out of a factory. It's a very uh, interesting link that um, the film came through this kind of um, industrial world. And at the same time, Uyghurs were really connected to the, actually in a way connected to the world uh, by doing the same thing as Lumiere Brothers. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think that this shows that uh, Wiggle communities have uh, always maintained connections with the outside world. You know, thinking about the important trading hubs uh, inside the region, uh, but then looking further uh, ahead in history uh, to these these more kind of industrial connections. But you're exactly right with uh, the very, I think, uh, important link to the Lumiere brothers. Um, and the first film made by the Lumiere brothers was called Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory. Uh, and we need to kind of understand this film and filmmaking as a, uh, as a symbol of progress because it's a product of development and technology. You know, really, it, it's only natural that we have this link between films and factory and production. So um, what about afterwards? Um, after Musabayev's uh, brothers had initially introduced motion picture to Uyghur people, did the um, this movement stopped? Is there was there any other um, films from that period before um, any creation of um, film industry in the in the region? Well, initially, uh, after the uh, introduction of films, until um, 1934 and all the way through 1946, there was kind of a stagnation uh, in production. Uh, at that time, that region was under the control of. Uh, Shang Shi Tsai, and he had a close relationship with the Soviet Union. Uh, so during that period, films made in the Soviet Union were brought into our homeland. Most of these were films about the October Revolution or those related to the Central Asian regions, which praised the Soviet Union. Uh, these films were screened in clubs where people would buy tickets to go and watch. So uh, what you're saying is uh, with um, these kind of Soviet Union uh, film, is it something uh, also very political that to control people's mind um, and to have a kind of influence um, on people's behaviors? Well, sure. I think there's always uh, going to be these very obvious political links between uh, films produced by socialist states uh, and the products that they're um, that they're sharing with with their audiences. And as you know, the Soviet Union was a socialist and communist country. Um, but especially when the Bolsheviks were in power, they of course would use films to praise their own figures and heroes, uh, their own government and achievements. And of course, this was precisely the reason these films were brought into uh, our region. But such is the nature of films. Although there were strong political messages, they were considered something new, a result of human advancement and important part of, of our collective culture. Hence, people watched them with interest. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, so during and after 1950s, after the Chinese Communist Party had occupied our homeland, um, there have been some, some film was made in these periods. And I also recall that my, my parents really liked some of the old films. It was like big um, in the Uyghur region. 
for example, Anar Khan or Mustaqdim Kelgen uh, Elchi, like guests from the icy ice mountains, or these kind of films were um, quite um, memorable in in Uyghur collective memory, and uh, of course they were like black and white films, and um, if you can a little bit elaborate on these period, like these films and how um, they explored Uyghur uh, culture or Uyghur life or how they had to reorganize uh, uh, Uyghur image. I, I believe these films are also had a kind of political agenda when it, they were made. Yes. Yeah, so immediately before uh, the Chinese Communist Party occupied our homeland. So between 1944 and 1949, there was really one noteworthy film. Um, At that time, the government had specifically gathered a film crew and sent them to our homeland to produce a film about Uyghur folklore. To this day, you can still find this film on the internet. There were scenes of dancing, uh, people playing music from uh, our culture and local areas, and this film was widely distributed. The film also uh, became important as it featured glimpses of the lives, culture, and art of Uyghurs at that time. I remember that film, seeing it somewhere. It was filmed around 1947, is that right? Yes, that's the one. This film was organized and shot by people from the Gomindang period, is it? Yep, that's right. Uh, After 1946, when the East Turkestan and Gomindang government made an agreement, the Guomindang organized that film crew to visit our homeland in 47, uh, and then they made the film. The film portrayed parts of inner China as well as our homeland. It all had become an important uh, film that featured our people from the era. After 1949, so after the change of governments and when the Chinese Communist Party had taken over, there was another period of stagnation in terms of the film industry as the Chinese government was working on stabilizing their power and control. Uh, whether in inner Asia or whether in inner China or in our region. Finally, in 1959, the film was produced about Uyghurs named uh, Bostanlukki Tantana. Then in 1961, a film named Yurlaktaki Uchkunler was made and it's based on the life of our famous hero poet, Lutpula Mutalip. Yes, that's that's also part of Uyghur cultural history, right? Um, The Jirachtiki uh, Ushkullar, based on Lutpula Mutalip's life. Do you know who made that film? Who wrote it? Mm, it would have been a, written by a Chinese writer and, and director, uh, Yurlaktiki Uchkunlar as well. These films were all written and made by Chinese writers and directors. Only the actors and storylines were Uyghur based. So between 1959 and 1963, a number of films such as Yurlaktiki Uchkunlar. Two Generations, Anar Khan, and Guests from the Icy Mountain were made. Bostan Lukki Tantana was about the soil and water policy of the Chinese government at the time. Yurlaktiki Uchkunar was about the patriot poet uh, Lutpula Mutalip. Anar Khan was about upper class citizens of the time. Two Generations was about ethnic harmony, and Guests from the Icy Mountains was made to oppose the spies of the Guomindang. Most of these were fictional but some of them were quite well made, like Anar Khan. However, you know, we should remember that these films were written and directed by Chinese writers and directors, as there are no film studios in our homeland. These are films made by studios from inner China that had come to our homeland. The commonality of these films was the central theme to iterate the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party and spread the ideology to our people. These specifically chosen characters and narratives of these films with the political backdrop would have been chosen and controlled by the Communist Party and um, members of them. It is a kind of important thing to understand when it comes to Uyghur films and also everything which was constructed based on this kind of Uyghur image. You're exactly right. And it, this was a common occurrence back then. Due to the fact that the Communist Party had just come to power, films made for purely entertainment uh, or to reflect the daily lives were rarely made. Uh, all of the efforts were put into promoting CCP ideology. Was watching film in cinemas um, a common thing back then? Um, like traveling cinemas in the villages, etc. At the time, there weren't uh, facilities for for widespread movie watching. There were, of course, no cinemas. 
however, there was a great interest in watching films in our homeland because of the lack of cultural experiences available back then. People were excited by films. It was something new to them, something exciting. Uh, the government organized groups of cinema workers to travel to villages to show these films usually using simple setups, uh, and they would project them outdoors. They would hang screens on trees or in barns in the villages. And in the big cities, they were shown in cinemas. People loved these films, and hence the Communist Party reached their goal at the same time. These films played a big role in influencing, influencing the minds of our people at that time. For Uyghur people, it was something new. Although the films influenced their ideology, they also found comfort in seeing their lives being portrayed on screens. Roles such as Anar Khan and Lutpula Mutalip or Amir had a great impact on the lives of, enti- of an entire generation. Films are such a powerful tool that cannot be underestimated um, in the sense that it can use, um, it can utilize singing and music, for example, to send powerful messages to massive audience at once, influencing the minds without even saying a word sometimes. Like you said earlier, they were um, able to play these music using such single setups until a theater where you um, will be needing at least 20 to 30 people to be uh, transported from city to city. In this case, films, you will essentially only be needing one person uh, to be broadcasted the message that the government is trying to send to the mass and as mask um, uh, make an impact. That is something that cannot be taken lightly. What happened after that period, for example, during the Cultural Revolution time? Just prior to the Cultural Revolution, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region was formed, and then the Tianshan Film Studio was created. In the early days, they collaborated with other film studios from inner China. Um, And the films we had mentioned earlier were made. However, during the Cultural Revolution, which began in 1966, the film industry had taken a step back in its entirety. Only the studios that made films focusing on government propaganda remained, such as Beijing Theater, making films on the Communist Party, etc. Between 1967 and 1976, the political atmosphere was quite dire. Most forms of arts and cultures were suppressed. The Tianshan Film Studio also stopped production and focused on translation of political films by studios from inner China, and they would use voiceovers. There was nothing new happening during that time. After the Cultural Revolution, I can recall even now, films such as uh, Gherib Sanam had come about in the um, 80s. These films have been um, really important for Uyghur society, like for artists, and also all the artistic production after that, they all um, took reference from these films. Um, These films uh, were collectively, for the collective memory of Uyghurs, uh, were something uh, to hold on to, especially after the period of Cultural Revolution. After the Cultural Revolution ended, China experienced a level of peace, freedom, and relaxation in terms of policies, uh, the economy, culture, and politics. During this period, and more specifically in 1981 and 1982, films such as Mr. Nasruddin and Khairab Sanam were produced. These movies are considered movies about Uyghurs, made by Chinese directors and written by Chinese writers. Although there are some political messages you know, about class wars. Uh, Overall, they were much less evident. It had showcased more historically and culturally accurate, accurate, relevant plots, which is why some of these films were loved by Uyghur people as well. These films played an active role in other races better understanding the Uyghurs. Um, We have just discussed that these works, stories, and characters, although were created by Uyghur artists and played by Uyghur actors, but the writers, producers, and directors were almost all Han Chinese. The Tianshan studio being under under the control of the government will have to make films that pleases them by making film that sends political messages. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult to show these films on the big screen. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the main frame of work was done by Uyghurs, including actors, but the ones who actually made these films were Han Chinese. 
Mm, yeah, in China, both the government and the majority Han people see ethnic minorities as underdeveloped, even backwards. They're seen as people that needed developing, direction, and saving, as is the ideology of a colonizer. In the film industry, ethnic minorities were always presented through rose-colored glasses. They have always felt a certain sense of responsibility, and here I'm talking about the government uh, and the Han majority to teach the ethnic minorities how to make movies, how to live, and how to be. Hence, the government had always shown a keen kind of interest in the films about Uyghurs and films made by Uyghurs. The period uh, between 1949 through the 1980s, the Central Theater Institute had two classes consisting of Uyghur students. They named it the Xinjiang class. There were over 100 students who graduated from these classes. Even then, classes on directing, writing, and other skills were never taught, just as soldiers were being trained, but not generals. This is due to the fact that they think the minorities are underdeveloped. They are not capable of doing what we can do, and so that they felt the need to do the main, most important work. This situation has continued on into the 80s and after. Uh, we all know that there was um, a director named Guan Chunlan, whom has um, made many films. One simply cannot avoid mentioning her name when talking about films that can represent Uyghurs in the 80s. Her, film are, her films are mostly on the topic of Uyghurs, but from the point of view of an um, invader. That was a really great question, and I think it provides us uh, an important opportunity to make an important distinction. What are films about Uyghurs, and what are films made by Uyghurs? The research conducted by Chinese on minorities and the theories that Uyghurs have come about on the Uyghur film industry is something that has been the topic of much debate and reached an agreement. If a film was produced, directed, etc., and was done by the Han Chinese on the topics of Uyghurs, we call that a film about Uyghurs. And if the film was produced and directed by Uyghurs, we say these films were made by Uyghurs. Although this isn't something that exists in the world, naming an industry by ethnicity. As all films made in a particular country is essentially a product of that country. For example, the French film industry, the Italian film industry, and the Chinese film industry. However, due to our own unique circumstances, living in China but having a very distinct culture than the Han Chinese, and never being... Uh, you know, never identifying with this sense of belonging, we have made this distinction. And as you mentioned before, the invasion lasted a long time and had impacts on politics, culture, and even worldviews. From the early 80s in our homeland, a Xibo a female director named Guan Chunlan had come about and dominated the film industry in our homeland. She studied directing and being a minority herself, although you know Xibo have very few cultural differences between Han Chinese, still the entire film industry, including the industry of other minorities, was in the palm of their hands. Sorry, Mukadas, if I could just interrupt for one second. I had a question about this part of your conversation with Tahir. He described um, this filmmaker as being Shive. Could you explain to me what that means? Yes, um, Guang Chunlan, she was not Uyghur and she was not Han Chinese. She was uh, ethnically Shive in Uyghur or Shibo in Chinese. It's another group of people who lives in Uyghur region as the uh, 13 other group of people who lives in, in Uyghur region as Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Tatar and uh, Russians and Shibe. And it's, it's one of these group of people who lives there. Got it. Okay. Some of her films were made quite well and were quite popular amongst Uyghurs. Films such as The Mysterious Caravan, Rana's Wedding, The Girl Who Couldn't Become an Artist, and others. These films had a lasting impact on a whole generation of Uyghurs, especially people that are in their 50s now. They grew up watching these films. However, after a while, the way she portrayed Uyghurs began, began to change. She started to depict them as seen in the eyes of Han Chinese because it was more appealing to them. She realized that simply making films about Uyghurs was not becoming famous in the Chinese film industry. In fact, people in inner China had never really heard of her. So she started to create Uyghur characters that would be more pleasing to Han Chinese audiences. She started to depict Uyghurs as people who love to sing and dance, who were energetic, and who always told lame jokes and made comical gestures. 
As you know, it is true that Wigglers love to sing and dance. It is a big part of our lives. Throughout history, we met many challenges, uh, oppression, bloodshed, and other tragedies. By maintaining our culture of singing and dancing, it had brought us comfort and helped navigate and survive these hardships. Outsiders, such as Guangzhou Nan, researchers and artists, by only looking at it from the surface level, and here I'm talking about that singing and dancing, the entire people uh, are attached with that, that label. Guangzhou Nan, in order to appease the Chinese viewers, had then started to make a series of films about Uyghurs that fit into these stereotypes, which was criticized by Uyghurs and even the Han Chinese viewers showed very little interest in watching these types of films. I'm not sure if this would be an accurate statement. However, from what I can see, it seems that she had contributed greatly to ru ruining our image in China, or more accurately, she had um, cemented a certain image of how people see Uyghurs. For example, if one is to visit a city in inner China, as soon as you say, I'm Uyghur, the first question being asked is, um, are you able to move your neck and dance? Rather than a normal conversation like, who are you, which city are you from, or uh, what do you do, etc. They would ask a girl, can you move your neck and dance? For a guy, they might ask, like, um, can you make a shish kebab or kebab? I believe these uh, perceptions have been shaped also by her films. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and in fact, because there were very few Han Chinese at that time that had traveled to Wiggle regions uh, and, and, and got to know Wiggles on a personal basis, that their only exposure to Wiggles were through uh, things like films. And the aspects of life that she picked and the personas used and created were rather strange. Wiggle people would watch and not recognize themselves. The Chinese viewer would watch them and think that this is what Uyghurs are like. It's possible that later on the idea of Uyghurs are thieves and or are inherently bad or even terrorists may have been or may have been uh, an origin from the characters of these films or may have originated uh, from the characters of these films. Because when one ethnic group has no real understanding of another or not interested in understanding it or getting to know it through different channels, it can create misunderstanding, even prejudice. These misconceptions are something that will slowly progress in the wrong direction, may even lead to discrimination, and will finally be completely false in the end. During the 15 years in which Guan Chunlan made films about Uyghurs, some of her own Uyghur directors were also making films. Mainly a man named Mehmet Min Hazrat, he wrote and produced Nor Nisa, Single Family, He Is My Son, etc. Followed by films like uh, Thing Called Money and Mola Zadin. These films were mainly directed by our teacher, uh, Yugun uh, Akmadi. This is the first time that Uyghur started making films independently. Although being Uyghur received as much support, nor did they have the opportunities that Guangchun Nan had. They had to pull through and make these films during the 1980s to late 1990s. VCD films had started to come about after this period, right? Uh, where, um, where a lot of new Uyghur films had started to emerge, including yours, with um, this crazy hat kick started, um, the true age of the Uyghur films start, have started. Could you please speak about like how that period was about? I'd be happy to. In, in 1996, a film named Do You Know This Person was made. Uh, this film was made by our famous director, uh, Kurban Jan Khait. Right around that time, VCDs had been invented by the Japanese. This is something that was in between tapes and DVDs. The market for burning VCDs flourished. During this period, Do You Know This Person was made with original sound with the famous actors of our opera trope. When it was released as a VCD and found success in the market, it was as if Uyghur filmmakers saw a huge opportunity. They believed that a good quality product and a market could be formed. This is the beginning of Uyghur cinema in the true sense. Perhaps their level is not as high as of well-known Italian, French, Hollywood, or Indian films, and the technical capabilities may not be as high. But a market was formed to meet our needs, and that was important. A lot of movies were made in those years. According to incomplete data, nearly 1,000 VCD movies were made between 1996 and 2005 alone. 
of these, much of them are very rough and poorly made. Uh, and of course, they had little investment. But there were also some great films like Is Alam Jan, Without the Ability, High Glass of Wine, This Is Not a Dream, and the movie I made, Moon is the Witness. Uh, another interesting thing about film during this period in terms of content is the way women are portrayed. In the three films I made, Moon is the Witness, The Dark Mountain, and The Mournful Tune of the Desert, the protagonist of each is a woman. I only know this, I only know this is later though. That is, the destiny of women was the main theme of our films during that time. We did not do this consciously. This has to do with the way Wiggles think about themselves at that time, how we discovered our own problems in society, and the attitudes we directed toward these problems. The social status of women in Wiggles society is a very important topic. For a nation that is struggling with tradition and modernity, between religion and science, between history and the present, and between the present and the future, and even between political pressure and liberty, the value and freedom of women is an issue that is truly important. I think this is one valuable aspect of these films. Starting from this VCD period, um, like different Uyghur people, different Uyghur artists and technicians came together. So to make this um, film world actually about Uyghurs from Uyghur community uh, to get into action, isn't is it right? As long as there are conditions and possibilities, we can take advantage of those limited conditions and overcome the difficulties and achieve many things. From my 20 years of experience in filmmaking, I can see the quality of our young generation, whether in terms of thought or diligence. I have trained film and television directors over the years, and I have witnessed their cultivation. They worked all over the region. Although there are uh, political pressures exerted by the Chinese government, they never stopped to preserve and develop our culture. It was very promising. Since 2006, we organized the Wiggler 12 Mukam and started filming it in, in various places in our homeland. To shoot an hour video for each Mukam. After that, we shot the Wiggler Mashrap. It's a total of 31. We worked uh, with dozens of groups at the same time. Since the beginning of the VCD era, several young kids have attained proficiency and has allowed us to complete large scale and complex shooting projects. You can find all these works on the internet and you'll see this is no small achievement. Yeah, I remember those VCDs about Uyghur Mukams and Mashraps. That, that was a lot of work and a lot of people were involved. So how these films were received by Uyghur audience was also an inter interesting point to talk about. Uh, I think Uyghur people loved these um, VCDs about Uyghur Mukams and Mashraps and that gave um, kind of... Um, a kind of um, Uyghur image uh, that Uyghur community wanted from these VCDs. Yeah, you're spot on. The most important factor here is that Uyghurs liked and supported films about their own lives. It is the aspiration of a nation to define its own identity. The passion of the Uyghurs for their own culture and values placed a motivating role there. Because movies involve the market and technology and especially capital, capital it's different from other art forms. A film requires a group of people carrying out camera equipment, going to certain places with a car, finding accommodations, eating together, shooting and coming back, plus lots of post-production work. Without funding, none of this can happen. Well, where does the money come from? It comes from the pockets of people. If people don't appreciate their artwork, if they don't want to see this stuff, the movie can't be made. So what do we do? We should be a creator by ourselves. For example, and as you probably know, I didn't study filmmaking. My major was literature. After I was re released from prison in 1999, I was left with nothing in Urumqi. I was fired from my job. I had no money. I had nothing but my residence certificate in my hands. At that time, one of my friends, Surla Jidin, the boss of Karlu Company, who graduated from Xinjiang University with a major in literature, suggested that I make a film. He said, there was one script called Moon is the Witness, and he wanted me to be the director. I had never filmed a movie, uh, I told him. He said he believed I could do it anyway, and I could do it well, uh, and we can make it on VCD disc and then release it. And then we can reimburse our investment. He said we could just need seven or 80,000 yuan to get it done. So I got into the field. In the beginning, I had no experience. I had to learn by myself, and I read a lot of materials about filmmaking. That's basically how I learned. I was a visiting professor at the Xinjiang Art Institute for 10 years. 
not because I graduated from any film school, but because of my self-taught ability. Even in the process of teaching, I benefited a lot. Maybe this is the way the number of people in this industry came about, become a specialist by being self-taught. So tell me about um, what happened after this uh, VCD area. Yeah, the VCD industry couldn't scale up because the films were not shown in cinemas, so they couldn't make enough money through ticket revenue. Then, with the advent of computer technology, it became possible for people to duplicate and distribute discs. So the VCD industry essentially died. At the same time, the political situation was getting worse. After a few years, only the official directors who had permission to make the mainstream movies could actually produce films. Since then, Uyghur cinema had been uh, in a very hard and precarious position. I don't want to say it's over, but after the July 2009 riots until really 2013, we were nervous to take a camera into Uyghur communities and especially onto the streets because so much blood was shed, so many people were arrested, and there were armed forces all over the place. It was not possible to go to the streets, and we didn't even want to go out. But after 2012, Xinjiang Television launched a range of programs and TV series in collaboration with private companies to target the market. Some TV series have been made, like Fun in the Office and The Story of Kashgar, which I shot. But these also were very difficult. For example, while working on the story of Kashgar, we were notified that we would not be able to use the words Salamu Alaikum and Walaikum Aslam. After much controversy, I said, we're supposed to be imitating the daily life of people. If you want to ban the saying, legislate it and make it illegal for Wiggles to use it. Then I won't have them say it on TV. And I just kept shooting the script as it was. But as you see, after 2017, Wiggles could no longer say those words. This means that from then on, other signs began to appear, and now Wiggle Cinema is in a state of disrepair. So when you say um, other signs of this began to appear, it's about restrictions, about things that Uyghurs cannot really fully embrace their own culture. Yes, unfortunately, I think you're right. I've been practicing in this field for 20 years, and I've made a living on it. To be honest, I put a lot of effort into milk making good films. I tried all sorts of things, but I didn't get the results I expected. I had always been passionate about Iranian cinema and collected Iranian movies. After diligently studying art, film for, from developing countries, I wanted to make movies about the lives of Wigglers. But it didn't happen. What is left behind are those movies uh, during the VCD era. The films of Mukam and Masrep and the last TV series. Among Wiggler directors, I am the one who has made the most documentaries. Uh, certainly, I'm passionate about filmmaking. I treat it as a part of my life, just like I write poetry. Uh, the difference in filmmaking is that, unlike poetry, I can't do it alone. I'm living abroad now. I have language difficulties, life pressure, and adjustment problems. Even in the United States, the status of my family and I have not been determined. Under such circumstances, I can't even think of a movie. But I want to make a movie about the modern migration history of Wigglers, or a movie that shows the Wiggler diaspora. But that doesn't seem to be possible anytime soon. However, I don't stop exploring and finding ways to pursue these dreams. A nation like ours cannot think too much of victory. Every small step and every battle we fight should be regarded as a victory. Every one of our attempts is a victory as long as we don't stop and move towards our destination. That's so inspirational. Thank you very much for sharing so much information about films about Uyghurs and films that Uyghurs themselves they made. And this has been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. So I wanted to just conclude by asking you where we can see your films. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And for anyone that's interested uh, in Uyghur films or films I've made, they should check out my YouTube channel. There are various works and documentaries, TV series, music videos, and movies there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uyghur Stories is hosted by Muqaddas Majid and John Baer. It is produced by The New Wild. Our audio engineer is Hashad. Our theme music was also composed by Hashad. Uyghur Stories is made possible with the support from the U.S. Embassy in Paris. 
For more information, please visit us online at www.weegorstories.com. That is www.weghurstories.com. Of course, you can find us on Instagram at Weegor Stories.